Today we want to consider the next purpose for the writing of the epistle. You will find it in chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, my dear children, my born-again ones, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. The epistle was written to proffer fellowship, chapter 1, verse 3, to promote joy, chapter 1, verse 4, and to prevent sin, chapter 2, and verse 1. Now the word sin and sinned in the noun and verb forms appear not less than 28 times in this little epistle of five chapters. You sit down and read it through, one sitting, five chapters, 30 minutes, 35 minutes. Keep your ballpoint pen at hand and underline every time you come to the word sin, either in a noun or verb form. You'll find it not less than 28 times. Hey, the Lord's saying something about sin to us in this epistle. One of the things he's saying is, Christian, dear child of God, don't sin. These things write I unto you that ye sin not. Now he's speaking here about a common corruption that is a part of all humanity. We want to look at this word sin as it appears in the singular number, not the verb form, but the noun. For example, if you will look at chapter 1 and verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, now that's not a particular act of sin, that means the principle of sin, the sin nature. If you say that you do not have the principle of sin in you, the scripture says you deceive yourself and you don't know the truth. Verse 8. You see, the sin nature, the sin principle is a part of every one of us. It's a part of humanity. No one has ever escaped the entrance of sin into this world. Every human being has had it with one exception. And John tells us in this epistle what the one exception is. We'll look at it in just a moment. Now, before we look at that, let's see how this sin principle, this sin nature, became a part of us. It's very difficult for some people to believe that they have a sin nature. Turn back to Romans chapter 5. Keep a marker in 1 John. We'll be coming back to it eventually. Romans chapter 5 and verse 12. Wherefore, as by one man, and that one man is Adam, by one man, sin, not any particular act of sin, the sin principle, the sin nature entered into the world. By one man, Adam, the sin principle, the sin nature entered into the world. Look at verse 15. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, that one was Adam, Mark Adam again in the margin of your Bible right there. Look at verse 17 of uh, chapter 5. Verse 16, rather. And not as it was by one that sinned, but one is Adam. Verse 17. For if by one man's offense, that one man is Adam. This is how sin entered into the world. In Psalm 51, verse 5, when David confessed his sins, he said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, he was not saying that the sexual relationship between his father and mother was sinful. No, he's simply saying, my mother had a sin nature, my father had a sin nature. When I was conceived in my mother's womb through my father's sperm, I came into the world with a sin nature. You see, like begets like. Everything reproduces after its kind. You don't plant a peach tree and get pull up red beets. Everything reproduces after its kind. That's the greatest hurdle that evolution cannot get over. Every time a, a male and female ape get together, they produce an ape. Any sense of evolution, you wouldn't have another ape. If we came from animals, well, where, where did things stop? There's something wacky with the evolutionary theory. Everything reproduces after its kind. You can't make a monkey out of me, no matter how hard you try. 
Everything reproduces after its kind. David is saying in Psalm 51.5, My mother had a sin nature. My father had a sin nature. When I came into the world, I came into the world with a sin nature. Now look at Romans 5.19. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners. The one man is Adam. Now suppose Adam and Eve would have had a child before they sinned. That child would have been a perfect sinless child because they would have had a nature exactly like mother and daddy. But they had no children before the fall. The children were conceived and born after they sinned. Therefore the children came into the world with a nature exactly like mother and daddy. Now people who don't understand that really they may not be Christians but the philosophy they can grasp for example uh, if a son does something naughty, his mother will say, Hey, hey there's a chip off the old block. Well, she's right. She's right. Now, if it's a girl, and the father, she'd say, There's a feather out of the old hen, and he'd be right too. Now, the world picks up this philosophy, and not necessarily Christians. And this is true. You don't have to teach your children how to lie and steal and commit sin. You don't send your children to a crime school to teach them how to lie and steal. They learned it from you, liar. You did it. They learned it from me. You don't teach your children how to sin. We're born with a built-in crime system. No one teaches us how to do wrong. We all have a sin nature. Now that's the sin principle taught in 1 John. Look at it again. Verse 8, chapter 1. If we say that we have no sin, that this sin principle has been eradicated from our lives, the Scripture says, you're only deceiving yourself. After all, sir, your wife knows better. And ma'am, your husband and your children know better. They're not stupid. Now, if we say that we have no sin, the sin nature, the sin principle, you're deceiving yourself. And the truth is not in you. Now, that's not a Straussism. That's what the Bible says in 1 John 1 8. Now, there's one exception to that. If you will turn to chapter 3, chapter 3 and verse 5, speaking of our dear Lord Jesus, John said, And ye know that he, our Lord, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin, singular. The Lord never had a sin nature. The sin principle was never a part of our Lord. That is why he did not sin, and that is why he could not sin. The Lord had no sin nature. He didn't inherit Mary's sin nature. He didn't have a human father. He was conceived of the Holy Ghost. All that Mary gave to the Lord Jesus was a body. He never inherited her sin nature. You say, what was the purpose of the temptation in the wilderness? It was not to discover whether or not Christ could sin. It was to prove that he couldn't sin. If our Lord could have sinned on earth, he can sin now in heaven. Because he is immutable, he cannot change. Hebrews 13, 8, he is the same yesterday and today and forever. He can't change. If he could have sinned on earth, he never said so. You never find anything in the Bible. Christ couldn't sin. He's God. James chapter 1, God cannot be tempted with evil. Why couldn't Christ sin? In him is no sin. Sin nature, the sin principle. We all have it. And we all have a basic weakness, and that basic weakness will show up eventually. Some people are chronic liars. Little children, you know. Come on, let's be frank now and honest. There are children who lie from early childhood. Mother says, now don't touch the cookie. She turns her back. Little girl steals a cookie. Mother says, honey, did you take a cookie? No, mama. Little thief, little liar. Uh, you know, well, where'd she get that? It's feather out of the old hen. We all have a basic weakness. That little girl grows up, still lying. Becomes a teenager, still a chronic liar. Becomes a young adult still a chronic liar, gets saved. Now, does that mean that now that she's saved or he, 
They'll never be tempted to lie again. Come on, you know better than to say no. Of course she will be tempted to lie again. She may not lie as frequently after she saved at first. And as she grows, she will lie less. But she'll lie again, and she'll be tempted to lie after she's saved. Why? The old nature is still there. It's still a part of her. It is never eradicated in this life. Now, don't you brag on yourself. Because you're not committing someone else's sin, that doesn't make you any better than they are. You have your own weakness. I have mine. There's a basic weakness in every one of them. Some people, it's a temper. And somebody, oh, I lost my temper. No, you didn't lose it. Wish you would. <laughs> Never find it again. Well, we don't lose our... Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Well, you said it. It's too late. You said it. You know, you shouldn't have said it. Why? That's your common weakness. Running off at the mouth. Got your mouth in motion before you get your brain in gear. And... Uh, we all have a basic weakness. Come on, let's be honest. The sin principle has never been eradicated from one person. If you say that that sin principle is not in you, the scripture says you deceive yourself and you don't know the truth. So go easy on passing judgment on other people. They may be committing something you don't commit. They may be doing a sin you don't do, but you have your weakness. You have your fault. I have mine. Now, this is the principle of sin, and it is never eradicated in this life. Just the time you think you have reached the age or stage of perfection, one of these days you're going to fall off your horse, and you'll wish you hadn't bragged on yourself. Don't think of yourself any higher than you ought to think. We're all sinners saved by grace. Now, in Romans 7... My understanding of Romans chapter 7 is that it is autobiographical. That is, the Apostle Paul is writing about himself as a believer, as a saved person. Let me read from verse 14. Now, the King James is, the wording here is not easy to grasp, but uh, I'm going to try to paraphrase a little bit and, and sort of speed it up. I'm reading from verse 14 of Romans 7. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I, writes the apostle, am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do, I allow not. That is, I, know, I do things I don't know I'm doing. For what I would, that do I not. Things I would do, I'm not doing. But what I hate, I do. I do things and I hate myself for. This is a, the apostle Paul speaking of his own experience. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. But it is no more I that do it, but what, class? Sin, the sin nature, the sin principle that dwelleth within me. Paul was conscious of the sin nature. He's writing about himself, you see. And he repeats this. Look at verse 20. Now, if I do that I would not, if I do the things that I don't want to do and I shouldn't do, it is no more I that do it, but sin, the sin principle that dwelleth in me. This is a believer, the great apostle Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, the sin principle, the sin nature is still in you and in me. Now, being controlled by the Holy Spirit, we can control that sin nature. We come to that a little later in our study. Now, <clears throat> we come now to what has been commonly referred to through the years as the two natures in the believer. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4, I have on a couple of occasions referred to that verse, which says that we believers have become partakers of the divine nature. The moment we are saved, God the Holy Spirit enters into the body of the believer. 1 Corinthians 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If you are saved, you have the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you have never been saved. Romans 8, 9. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. 
the incoming of the Holy Spirit takes place at the time of our salvation, our regeneration, our new birth. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. Now that's called the divine nature. He is called the divine nature, 2 Peter 1.4. Now when I become a partaker of the divine nature, my human nature is not eradicated. Still a part of me. So what happens? There's a conflict going on within me. Here, Paul said it. I do things I don't want to do. When I do them, I know I shouldn't have done them. I am not doing things I ought to do. You see, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we are in a conflict. We're in a battle every day we live. And the battleground is really the battleground of our own personality. It's right here. This is where the, the conflict is. And people say, well, the devil made me do it. Christian, when you make a statement like that, that's an indictment on you. That's an indictment. You know what you're saying? Let me show you what you're saying when you say the devil made me do it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. And I'm going to read just a verse or two beginning with verse 10. Ephesians 6, 10. Have it? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Now watch. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. If you and I are not standing against the wiles of the devil, it's because we're not wearing our armor. It's right there in black and white. You put your armor on before you start today. The devil can't touch you according to the scripture. And all the pieces of armor are listed here. Wear your armor. When you said the devil made me do it, what you're saying is you didn't put your armor on. You're blaming the devil for your own failure to put your armor on before you start your day. Here it is, Ephesians 6.11. You don't have to be a high school graduate to understand that. Don't ever blame anything on the devil, child of God. You are confessing your own failure, your own weakness. Put on the whole armor of God. You'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Don't ever blame Satan for your bad choices. Don't ever do that. You're indicting yourself. Now, turn to Galatians chapter 5. Paul in Galatians 5 explains this conflict between the two natures. He says in Galatians 5, verse 17, For the flesh lusteth, or warreth, is a conflict against the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. Now, the word flesh here does not mean what you see covering the skeleton of that hand. That is flesh. There's no question about it. That is flesh. But that's not what it means. If you will drop the last letter, H, and spell the four remaining letters backwards, you will have the meaning, the literal meaning of that word flesh. S-E-L-F. So, the old you, the old me, the old self, Adamic nature. And self is selfish. That's the meaning of that word flesh. The flesh, not the literal flesh that covers the skeleton of the body. The flesh, the old self, fights against the Holy Spirit. That's the two natures in the believer. There's a conflict going on there. Now he said in verse 16, walk in the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust or the desires of the flesh. Be spirit-controlled instead of self-controlled. Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled by the Holy Spirit. A Christian controlled by the Holy Spirit is not controlled by self. But most of us, all of us, are basically selfish, aren't we? Oh, does it show up in our prayers. You know, Lord, bless me. Bless me, bless me, bless my wife, bless my husband, bless my children. Yes, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me, bless me. Just begging, 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 begging. And most of our prayers are selfish. They have to do with our wants, 
The Bible says, My God shall supply all your need, not all your greed. We are basically selfish. So there's a conflict going on. Now Paul said, Walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the old self. Now let's come back to the first epistle of John. Chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. That's the prohibition of sin. Sin not. Don't do it. But he follows that up immediately with the possibility of sin. Don't do it, but if you do. And he knows that the possibility is there. Because we all have the sin nature. 1 John 1, 8. If we say we don't have it, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now the sin nature is there. Now here you have the verb. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. That's a verb. Do not sin. That's not the noun form. It's the verb. Now if you do sin, the verb again. If you do commit an act of sin. Now you have the prohibition of sin. Don't do it. The possibility of sin, if you do. Now you have the provision for that sin. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now that word advocate is the same word paraclete translated comforter four times in the gospel according to John. And it means helper. One called alongside to help. Now when we Christians commit a sin... We have an advocate, now please notice this, not with God. Oh, he's God. But the term that is used here is with the Father. You see, the sin being committed in 1 John 2, 1 is the sin of a believer. My dear children. He's talking to believers. This is a family letter. This is for Christians. These things write I unto you, don't sin. But if you do, we have an advocate with, not with God, oh, he's God, all right, but the Father. He's speaking about this relationship between the believer and his heavenly Father. Now, who is this advocate? He's the one who settled the sin question legally, judicially, justly, once and for all time. You have a legal advisor, a legal representative in heaven facing up to the Father for you and for me. Now what's he saying? He's not saying, Father, give Layman Strauss a break. Father, be easy on him. Father, don't, don't be hard on him. That's not what our lawyer is doing. That's not what our advocate is doing. He's there as our helper, but what is he doing? He's there to represent us, not begging for leniency. We don't deserve that. He's there as the one who already died for that sin that I committed. You see, when the Lord Jesus died on the cross, none of us were born yet. All of our sins were future. And he died for all of our sins. That includes the ones we haven't committed yet. So positionally, we are in the family through faith in Christ. We were born into the family. Now, all children sin. That doesn't sever the relationship with their parents. It may break the fellowship. But you can't break the relationship. It's there by birth. Now, these are the dear children. And we all do it sometime. Commit sin in thought, word, or deed. But if you do... There is someone in heaven representing you. It's the sin of a child of God, and there we have a helper. Now, in Revelation 12.10, we have an accuser. The devil is called the accuser of the brethren. And every time I sin, he says, there you are, there he is. There's that preacher. There's that teacher. You hear what he just said? Hear him brag? Hear him get angry? He's called the accuser of the brethren. But every time he accuses us, God doesn't hear the accuser. He hears the advocate, his son who died for that sin. 
Now, this is based on the great doctrine of justification. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. See if we can just enlarge a little bit on this great truth. Romans chapter 5. Therefore being, past tense having been, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now justification is the sovereign act of God whereby he declares righteous. It's a legal term, a courtroom term, a forensic term. Fifty-eight years ago, I came to God as a young sinner, deserving of hell. And I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior. And God said to me that day, not guilty. I now justify you. I declare you righteous. Justification is not making righteous. It's a legal term, a declaration. Therefore, being justified, having been declared righteous by faith. God said, you're not guilty. Now, I was guilty. But God said, not guilty. God said, I justify you, but I don't deserve it. I, I'm, I'm not just. No, but God justifies me because His Son died for my sins. And the day I came to God through faith in Christ, God declared me just, righteous. That's a legal term. I am no more justified after 58 years than I was the split second I was saved 58 years ago. God declared me righteous. I've been standing in grace for 58 years. It says so in Romans chapter 5. Look at it. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. We've been saved by grace. We stand in grace. My dear people, you and I could no more keep ourselves saved than we could save ourselves. I hope there's no one so conceited that you think you can keep yourself saved. Well, you can no more keep yourself saved than you could save yourself. We are kept by the power of God. We were saved by grace. We stand in grace. But we do commit sin. There's our legal advisor, not begging for leniency, not saying, Father, give him a break, give her another chance. No, he's simply there as our legal advisor. I died for that sin. Now, let's look at, further at this subject in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. You have the Bible open to 1 John, just back to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. Who his own self bear our sins. How many of them? All of them. In his own body on the tree. Who his own self bear our sins sins in his own body on the tree. The Lord saying, Father, when I hung on the cross, I died for that sin. And he pleads my case. You see, Hebrews 7.25 says, He ever liveth to make intercession for us. Beloved, you have someone in heaven who prays for you every day. The Lord Jesus. He ever liveth to make intercession for us. 1 Peter 3.18 he, the just one, suffered for the unjust. Am I doing right when I sin? I'm doing wrong. But the right one died for those sins, and he's there as my advocate, my legal advisor. Now let's turn quickly to 1 John 2 again, and we want to look at this word propitiation. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Are you ready for the rest of it, Christian? And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Don't forget that. We're not favorites with God. He died for the sins of the whole world. That's what your Bible teaches. God's not playing favorites with sinners. God loves the world that whosoever believeth in His Son shall not perish but have everlasting life. Now what is this business of the propitiation? The verb to propitiate carries with it the idea of to cover. Back in the Old Testament, there was an ark. 
And there was a lid on that ark. It was called the mercy seat. And when the high priest went in to the holiest of all, he never went in without a blood sacrifice. Incidentally, Hebrews chapter 9, while I'm speaking, if you can turn to it quickly, we have just a few minutes to uh, point this out. Hebrews chapter 9, he never went in without a blood sacrifice. And what he did with that blood was to sprinkle it on the lid of the ark. And that lid was called the mercy seat. Leviticus chapter 25, repeatedly, the mercy seat, the mercy seat, the mercy seat. And when God saw the blood sprinkled on that mercy seat, he showed mercy to the sinner outside who brought that blood sacrifice and gave it to the priest who took it in and presented it to God, sprinkled it on the mercy seat. And when God saw the blood, he was merciful to the one who brought the sacrifice. Now the Old Testament sacrifices were types of the great once for all sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now turn to Hebrews chapter 9. We read that uh, verse 4, which had the golden center and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of covenant, and over it the cherubim of glory shadowing the mercy seat. That was the lid on the ark. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year. Now watch it. Not without blood. It could never appear without blood. It had to have a sacrifice. And when God saw the blood on the mercy seat, he showed mercy to that sinner who brought that animal and had it slain as a sacrifice. Now he says in verse 9, that was a figure for the time present. Just a type, you see. But verse 11, Christ being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place having obtained what kind of redemption? Eternal redemption for us. My dear friend, when you got saved, you were given eternal life, not temporary life. Eternal life. And God only needed that one sacrifice. Christ didn't have to die twice. Only once. That satisfied God. Now, you have the word propitiation one other time in 1 John. 1 John, and chapter 4, and verse 10. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, what's the word propitiation mean? Mercy seat. The place where God shows mercy. Now, we're going to look at the only other appearance of that word propitiation in the English Bible, and it's in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. The only other appearance of that word propitiation in the English Bible. Romans 3 and verse 25. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now what's the word propitiation mean? Mercy seat. Mercy seat. I'm going to direct you to a little story that the Lord told, then we'll be on our way. Turn to Luke chapter 18. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the 18th chapter. When you've found the 18th chapter, I will begin reading with verse 9. Parable of our Lord. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. You're not trusting in yourself, are you? Well, I'll never commit that sin. She did it, but I never do it. Oh, come, come. Don't trust in yourself. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. People who are self-righteous can see the faults of others. They're always finding fault with others. Nothing wrong with them. They've got to find fault with someone. I'm perfect. So it's easy for me to find the faults in my wife. I don't have any. 
If I see any, I have to see them in her. They went up to the temple to pray, and they have trusted in themselves. They were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, a tax collector, and the other a publican. A, tax, a publican was a tax collector, I'm sorry. The Pharisee, the self-righteous, religious churchgoer who went to the synagogue every Sabbath, who put his tithe in the offering box every Sabbath, he stood and prayed thus with himself. Now, he uses the word God. When he's praying with him, he says, God! Now he's suffering from a spiritual sickness. It's called perpendicular pronoun iitis. This guy had a bad case of it. Look at it. Lord God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. What a spiritual sickness. I, Idas. Guy was wrapped up with himself. A person wrapped up with himself makes a very small package. <laughs> but the publican, the publican standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, Now watch it. God be the King James says merciful. Do you know what he said in the Greek text? God be propitious to me, a sinner. God be merciful. Now watch. Many times when someone's leading a soul to Christ, they will say, pray the public in prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Listen to me. No one ever needs to pray that prayer. The publican prayed that prayer on the other side of the cross before Jesus died. My dear people, when Christ died on the cross, God was merciful. You don't have to ask God to be merciful. Christ is our propitiation, 1 John 2. He is our mercy seat. His blood was shed. Don't have to ask God to be merciful. Come and receive Christ. Through faith in His blood, He becomes our propitiation, Romans 3.25. You don't have to ask God to be merciful. The publican prayed the prayer on the other side of the cross before Jesus died. But our Lord shed His blood. You see, the next move now is on the sinner's part. God did all He intends to do for unsaved people. Now when we Christians sin, we have an advocate, a legal advisor with the Father. But you say, oh, Brother Strauss, what should I do with my sin? First John 1, 9, you confess it and forsake it, and you're back in fellowship, back in business again with God.